I'm going to thank you all for being here. For those of you who, who don't know, uh, I'm Glenn Poole and I'm the CEO of the Australian um, Men's Health Forum. I want to start today by acknowledging the owners of the traditional lands where we all meet across the country today and pay my respect uh, to the elders past, present and emerging and to pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, joining us on Zoom today. Um, really excited to, uh, to have you all in the room. Male suicide is a, is a very serious issue that, uh, as I'm sure you, I don't need to tell the people gathered here today, some very simple statistics to remind us. Across Australia, eight people a day die by suicide, six are men and two are women. Do we care about women who take their lives? Of course we do deeply, and we know that um, we need to do more to prevent that. But clearly we're also missing something when 75% of people who suicide are, are men. So there's lots of great expertise in the room, and I want to uh, really thank um, the uh, New South Wales uh, government for inviting us to uh, and agreeing to uh, allow us to bring together this group of people. Just to set your expectation, there are two key parts of the day. One is a virtual round table where we've got nine or 10 uh, key experts. We've asked to have a, have a, have a chat with, um, with the minister, uh, Ronnie Taylor. Uh, and in the second part, we've uh, tried to put you all into relevant groups. Um, just allow that process to unfold. And if you think you're in the wrong group, you can message us and we can move people around. But we think we've probably got 90% of you into the right groups. And that's when you're going to get a real opportunity to contribute your, your, your thoughts and your ideas to the question of what more we can do to prevent suicide uh, in, um, in New South Wales in particular. That's all I'm going to say for now. I'm going to hand over to, um, to the Honourable Bonnie Taylor, who is Minister for Mental Health and Youth and Women across New South Wales. Uh, thanks for being here, Bronnie. No, thanks so much. Thanks for having me and thanks for organising. Terrific. And you said there's over 80 people on, so... Welcome to everyone. That's, um, that's really great. I'm really pleased to have you all here. I think that um, the only way we can keep, keep improving and keep looking at getting better outcomes is if I hear from experts on the ground. So um, I'd like to, you know, thank everyone for their time today and, and thank the organisers for understanding, for bringing it to fruition. I understand today is about bringing the experts around to a round table so that we can have some good discussions. I look, I have a lot of men in my life that I love. I'm um, from rural New South Wales, where um, we have a, a high rate of mouth suicides that occurs. We've been through a really terrible drought, really difficult bushfires, and, um, and now COVID-19. So um, it's been a particularly trying time for all of us, but I think um, we could honestly say for rural and regional men, it's, it's really been tough. And they are notoriously um, not people that want to put their hand up for help. So and I'm married to one of them, so I've got a pretty good idea about that. Um, I'll take you through a few things that we're doing in relation to addressing suicide, but what I'd really like to do is hear from you because you guys can hear me talk anytime. So, um, but I'm really excited that we are putting new money into suicide and the reason, uh, suicide prevention, and the reason I say that is because it is really important when it's new investment because that allows us to try new things and to have new opportunities to do things. I think one thing about this time in COVID is that um, it's allowed us to look at sort of being able to be a bit more flexible in government and be able to have investments that then we can go out and trial and we can get moving a bit faster. And it was interesting this morning just to pivot to um, domestic violence. We were able to do an announcement today and this was exactly what was coming back from that sector as well, that this, the added investment allows us the opportunity to try a few different things and in a different time. So I think there's a positive in that and I think there will be in terms of suicide prevention. Um, I guess what I just quickly wanted to go towards was that the New South Wales government and particularly the Premier has actually said that suicide prevention is one of her main priorities. So although that might, might seem like a bit of a political comment, it's actually in terms of um, where we sit in government, it's really important because when those things sit as a priority of the Premier, it means that they're, they're, balanced, they're balanced to, they're reported to, and we have to come back with what we're doing and it's very closely watched. So I think that's a really good thing. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is we're looking at alternatives to emergency departments. I'm particularly excited about this initiative. We've seen it working really well down in Melbourne out of St Vincent's and um, I was recently down there with some members of my team 
looking at that. I'm really excited at the model and I'm really excited that we're rolling that out. I'm very hopeful that in the next three months we'll be able to look at opening two of those in New South Wales. Um, I think it's an important thing. I think it's a necessary thing. I think that it's demonstrated in other states that it's working really well. We've also invested in assertive suicide um, prevention outreach team. So these are new positions, these are new teams, and this is new work. So I think, again, that, that greater investment and that greater focus on that and that ability for those teams to be able to help right across the health sector and across non-government organisations will be really powerful. Um, we're also looking at, um, I'm really, pleased that with the drought and with the bushfires, it allowed us to look at some different roles in different positions. Um, our farm gate councils and our drought support peer workers have been extremely successful on the ground. Um, I, I talk about this because I think it's something that we do, and any of you that have heard me speak at anything before, I think that it's something we do really well in mental health. I think that you leave the rest of the health sector behind in the fact that with your, with your use of peer support and also with your use of people with a lived experience. So for example, one of our farm gate councillors in Orange is an ex truckie He spent his life carting livestock out of the area when the drought was really bad. And so talking to farmers and then pivoted into his role as a drought support worker. He's been instrumental in, in saving lives and but most importantly, in, in looking after people's wellbeing because he understands what they're going through. So I'm really, I'm very excited about that, um, that program as well. Uh, we also, I've just, my screen's gone black, so I hope everyone can, can still hear me. We can oh, hear I'll, you. Hear right. you and see you, and see you. Oh, okay. oh, okay, all right, well, that's good. I better not do anything. Um, so I suppose we're looking at um, involving local, local organisations. We want to hear from you on what you think. I, I also need to say too that, you know, government can never, um, we can't come up with all the great ideas. They come from the ground, they come from all of you, and we just are able to provide the opportunities to get those happening. Um, we've also looking at gatekeeper training as well, which I think will be really important and we're rolling that out as well. So it's just about trying to get that message out there to say that it's important, to say that we're committed to it. And, um, and look, I am, I am excited because I'm really lucky that um, I've come in at a time where we're able to have this investment and we'll be able to see increased services on the ground. So I guess, look, that's probably all from me. I'm really happy to, I just want to hear from you. So um, I'm going to be quiet and, um, and hear from you. But if you have any questions or anything, I'm really happy to do that as well. Thank you, Minister. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for all that you've shared and thanks for your uh, thanks for being here to actually hear what others have got to say and share and contribute. Um, and so if you haven't heard me say it already, I'm going to reinforce there is a chat box. Um, we've asked 10 people uh, and I would have liked to have asked every single one of you and more besides because there's so much knowledge and, and experience in, in, in our overlapping sectors of suicide prevention, health, men's health fathering and so on and so forth uh, and we have to select a few um, there are some voices obviously missing and we'll do our best to keep including as many different voices as possible but for those of you in the room you have the opportunity to contribute both now through the chat box as this session is ongoing and also in the breakout sessions in the second part of, of the day so please do please use that feature uh, chat away uh, and keep an ear on what the experts are, are sharing as well. We've set people a specific challenge. I'll just put you on warning, Professor John McDonald. I'm gonna, gonna come, to you, come to you first in a second. Um, we've set these people with years of experience and a wealth of knowledge who could hold a room on what they know for an entire day and more to uh, tell us in two minutes what one thing they'd like the minister to be uh, aware of. It's a cruel task but I'm sure we'll get lots of really interesting information in the process. So let me let, let, me let you know that after Professor John McDonald, we'll have Dr. Scott Fitzgerald and then Dr. Anthony Brown. And I'll keep letting you know who's coming next so you can prepare yourself uh, and, and not be concerned about who's next. Um, and you can fully listen in to the great people speaking. Um, I'll hand over the microphone to um, dear friend and great to sort of bring him out of retirement John, for this, uh, this event, really thank you for being here, Professor John McDonald. Very kind. Thank you very much. And thanks very much to the Minister and to all of you for being here. 
And like you, I would acknowledge um, the indigenous people of the country, especially those who suffered from suicide. You did say three minutes, so you're now saying two minutes, so I shall cut down. Okay. I'm told to say who I am, apart from being in retirement since last, last December. I am the Foundation Chair in Primary Health Care at Western Sydney University. I am, I am the co-founder of the Australian Men's Health Forum, which I'm very proud of. I'm also the co-founder of the Men's Health Information and Resource Centre. That's 20 years ago at Western Sydney University. Among other things, I've been a consultant to the 2010 Men's Health Policy, which has had an effect on the Men's Health Study. And recently with Jane Perkis, the, um, the Suicide Study. Um, I'm patron of the Men's Shed Association, one of the two patrons, and I'm very proud of that. It has relevance for, for suicide as well. Most of all, I would like to say that we did a small study with one of the colleagues who's here um, and with people on the Central Coast almost 20 years ago about suicide. We found, I found when I started being interested in men's health and in suicide, we found studies on how men killed themselves, but not why. And the conclusion of that little study, which we called Pathways to Despair, has actually been hinted at um, this morning by the minister herself, by talking about drought and people are talking about unemployment. We found that, and I still hold that very strongly, that these are the social determinants of suicide. And with respect to people who still think that the way to get rid of suicide is to get men to talk. And I noticed, for example, in, the, in the, what Ian was saying about the men talking, men walking, they don't just walk, they talk, and they support one another. Behind suicide, there's not just a weak man who needs, who's unable to talk to other people. There is often a social factor which has to be looked at. Recently, unemployment, and that I think is the big challenge, the real big challenge for those of us in suicide prevention. With respect, it's fairly easy to say men should talk. Of course we should talk, and of course it helps, but it's not enough. Um, therefore, I want to say briefly, that's it, that um, I would be an advocate not just for men's health and suicide prevention, and I was involved in that in New South Wales suicide prevention years ago, trying to get them to take seriously male suicide. That's happening. The whole thing is shifting towards men and towards the not just blaming men for being men or their masculinity, which I think we should question, at least critically question, but to look at those things which are behind suicide. And the challenge is, because it's not easy to deal with them, but at least to acknowledge them and to um, try to put in place factors which, like the drought has been mentioned by the minister, that's not just getting men to talk about the drought, it's doing something to help them. The social determinants of male suicide would be my message to the group. Thank you. Thanks, John. I really appreciate you being here. That's Professor John McDonald. We've uh, posted a link to your, to your study in the chat box there, John, so people can go and visit if they want to. Again, I encourage you to use that chat box to share links or to confirm. John also made a reference to the man walk there, and I saw the man, Mark from the man walk uh, jumped in and said hello. So these are ways you can use the chat box uh, whilst people are um, uh, speaking and sharing their, uh, their thoughts. Uh, I'm going to hand over to um, Dr. Scott Fitzgerald, who will, um, uh, Fitzsimmons, sorry, who will uh, introduce himself. I don't know him that well. Sorry, doctor. Uh, I know rural health's his thing. I'll allow him to introduce himself much better than I can. Thank you, Glenn. And it's Fitzpatrick, actually, but that's, <laughs> that's been an experience of my childhood as well. So always getting my name in the paper for little sporting events, and they would always print it the wrong, the wrong way, um, but not to worry. Um, so look, I guess, um, just as way of introduction, I'm a research fellow um, based in Orange at the Centre for Rural and Remote Mental Health at the University of Newcastle. Um, and so I'm a, a researcher, and I guess at the broadest level, my research investigates topics such as the social determinants of suicide, rural suicide and lived experience, um, and have a particular emphasis on policy and practice. Um, so currently one of the studies I'm involved in is a mixed method study of uh, 3,400 rural cases of suicide across four states using the data from the National Coronial Information System. Um, and as well, I've also undertaken a range of community-based research um, that is particularly directed at sort of strengthening health systems and improving outcomes for people in rural New South Wales. So I guess of particular relevance for this forum are uh, uh, work that I conducted in 2017 with the Western New South Wales PHN. Um, and this was involving community consultations and work plan design for the National Suicide, suicide Prevention Trial um, that was being conducted across four sites in Western New South Wales. 
Uh, so four remote sites. Um, and I'm also involved in a research project with the University of New South, University of New, sorry, University of South Australia, uh, the National Centre for Pharma Health and Deakin University and ASRAP uh, at Griffith on suicide prevention for farming communities. Um, and so very briefly, this project involves working with key stakeholders to develop place-based suicide prevention strategies tailored to men in farming occupations. Um, and it is a difficult task to think of the one key thing um, to focus on, um, but I think I'd sort of follow on from, from what uh, someone, what John was saying, and I think it's really imperative that we do not assume that the category men is a homogenous group um, and that we really identify important within group differences. Uh, so there's clearly a space for universal interventions that target men, but you know I think we also need to develop sort of selective and indicated uh, interventions for specific subgroups. So John talked about unemployed men. So again, in our study, that's you know we were finding that it was almost you know 50% of male suicides in rural areas were not in the workforce. So there are either unemployed or disability pensioners or pensioners. Um, men experiencing drug and alcohol issues, so a big issue there as well. Men working in farming occupations and, and other manual trades. Uh, elderly men with physical health problems and young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men. Um, so I guess to do this, uh, I would sort of really uh, recommend to the minister that we need to look at that integrating social services and integrating them within health. Um, I think a lot of the time, you know, the National Suicide Prevention Trial was a good example. Non-health services were, weren't within the remit of that project. So when we would go to communities, that's just what they wanted. They wanted, you know, non-medical safe spaces for people to, you know, to do art, to do other kinds of sort of, um, you know, therapeutic sort of work, um, um, you know, for those who are vulnerable through housing or through from release from prison. Um, but, you know, they were really not within that remit of the funding. So that would be my one thing for the minister to, I guess, be able to integrate some of that sort of social services within, within suicide prevention systems. Thank right. you. Thanks, Dr. Fitzpatrick. Uh, really appreciate it. I can understand you've got much more to offer beyond that, but thank you for synthesising that so well. Yeah. Um, I'm going to come to Dr. Anthony Brown in a moment, and then after that will be Pete Nichols, and after Pete will be Brad Parker. Dr. Anthony Brown. That's great. Thanks so much, um, Glenn, and thanks for inviting me to be part of this. Um, so I'm, I'm the CEO of Health Consumers New South Wales. Health Consumers New South Wales is an organisation that works with people who use health services, um, to integrate their lived experience into not just the design of health services, but the governance and running of them. Um, I'm also an adjunct fellow at the Men's Health Information Resource Centre with Professor McDonald, and I worked there for some 14 years before this position. Um, and I'm currently the chair of Global Action on Men's Health, which is an international coalition of men's health organisations like the Australian Men's Health Forum, who are working to put um, men's health issues um, on a global, um, on an international scale. The one key thing that I would add to this, and it's really a continuation of what Scott and John have said, is I feel really strongly that we need to have many local responses and local programs to respond to the issue um, of male suicide, and that these programs need to involve people with lived experience in their design and most importantly in their governance. Um, the Minister spoke about the importance of peer workers and how well mental health services have integrated peer workers into their work. I think we need to go beyond that um, and include people with relevant lived experience in the running of the organisations. And the importance of having like real local responses, um, I, I think can't be overemphasized. We've seen um, a tendency with government programs to actually fund a small number of large providers. Um, and while this has, you know, is effective in some situation, I think what it has done, one of the effects of this is it's actually taken skills and resilience out of local communities. And I can think of two examples. One is after the recent bushfires, there was an announcement made that there'd be more mental health services, which is fantastic. But those services went to a small number of large organisations who didn't have the local infrastructure. And when there were GP offices that had been burnt out and local GPs and services on the ground with 
just a little bit of support could have responded. Um, also, what we're seeing at the moment is services that are offering like particularly outreach services in rural locations around child protection. With COVID, people aren't able to travel, those workers aren't able to travel, which means child protection works being picked up as best it can by sort of small local groups. So I think those programs, I don't think they work as best as they can in the best of times. And now in these challenging times, we're seeing that they're actually reaching breaking point. So, yeah, small local responses that involve people with lived experience. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Brown. Um, and great to see you here. Like so many people across the men's health sector, not just a great colleague, but a, a, a great friend and, a, and someone who has just such wide ranging experience in addition to the consumer health um, hat that he wears. Oh, I'm uh, blushing. <laughs> behave. And um, Anthony mentioned their um, lived experience experience. I just want to acknowledge that one of the people who helped us put this event together right from the start was, um, was, was Bronwyn Edwards, Bronnie Edwards of Roses in the Ocean, who I know have done loads of work across New South Wales and she was due to be with us uh, and had some personal stuff to deal with uh, very uh, early this morning and so a sense of apologies. I do think some of the men who've been, uh, who represent Roses in the Ocean are here today and will be in the lived experience peer group. So I'm, I'm sure she would, re re she would have emphasized the value of ensuring that the lived experience is heard. And in this case, that the lived experience of men and experience of male suicide is heard. I'll be coming to Pete Nichols in a moment, followed by Brad Parker and then Tim Hodgson from Gotch for Life to queue you up. Um, Pete Nichols. Good morning, can you hear me all right? Yes, thanks Pete. Yeah, good, cool. Right, so uh, great to see so many uh, key influences and uh, uh, experts from the sector all in one place. So well done putting this together. Um, so look, by way of introduction, I'm Pete Nichols. I'm the chief exec of Parents Beyond Breakup. We're a national suicide prevention, not intervention charity. The public tend to know us through our frontline support brands of dads in distress and mums in distress. Now, our focus is on separating parents, primarily men, not least that when we open our doors without any fear or favor, 95% of who walks through that door will be a separating man. Each year we interact with mums and dads around six to 12,000 times, uh, typically through our national telephone support helpline, through approximately 20 community-based support groups, which are currently suspended due to COVID, and more lately uh, via daily online video conference-based support groups. Now, research that we conducted about three years ago suggests that just over 50% of new attendees of our support arrive reporting recently having felt some level of suicidality. By the third interaction group, telephone call, whatever, that report drops to less than 1%. That dramatic change occurs because of a focus on peer-delivered practical help around their particular psychosocial challenge, which is family breakdown. Now, crucially, 89% of people that come to us say that they are unable to find any other help that meets that practical support need. So in regard of general suicide prevention policy, my one takeaway from this would be that whilst the historical focus on mental health is good and something that we as an organization and I would def definitely support, indeed much of what we deliver is based on good mental health practice, our experience suggests that a greater focus on practical help addressing psychosocial problems can and does have a significant impact. And the challenge that we and others like us face is that it is very hard or near impossible to be funded for this type of peer support work on any scale because we're not easily classed or recognized within the traditional mental health provider sphere. So my view is a greater focus on practical help around these factors. It's something I've already heard from the other speakers is where we as a nation and certainly as a state can most benefit in reducing the suicide rate, particularly amongst men. Bravo. You're on mute there, Glenn. You're on mute there, mate. The wonders of Zoom. I uh, went into mine, so lit readers will have heard what I said, uh, but I'll just repeat, just thanks to that, Pete, it's an issue that's dear to my heart. Personally, my lived experience as a, as a separated father was, was, was what first alerted me um, to this issue when I had personal experience uh, some 20 years ago now 
and I know the uh, the experience of separation is still uh, raw and a real risk um, for people, uh, particularly particularly fathers when children are involved. Um, so the next speaker will be um, um, Brad Parker, and then will be Tim Hodgson, and then on to Professor Richard Fletcher. Um, Brad Parker of Mates in Construction. Thank you, Glenn, and uh, thank you to everybody, and thank you to the Minister, Bronnie Taylor, and um, uh, for, for being part of this. And um, so I'm Brad Parker, I'm the CEO of Mates in Construction. Um, if you don't know who we are, we're a, uh, we're a training, um, we do training, but an integrated program, not just training, but essentially we teach construction workers on site, um, those signs of suicidality, what to look for, and then how to keep someone safe while connecting them to help. Um, we also have case management um, and we do a number of other things. Um, just quickly, I just want to say that I think the minister mentioned uh, regional areas. Um, uh, certainly there's a, we, we're all aware, I think that there's a heightened uh, problem out in regional areas around suicide and mental health. Certainly when I've been on road shows with the Master Builders Association, um, people after doing my presentation, uh, they're all lining up to come and come and talk to us. We do do uh, regional areas. We get out there where we can. We are um, impacted by our funding. Um, we'd love to, to get better funding so we can um, get, a, get across the industry. Just one example of the fact that we're underfunded was the Parramatta Light Rail pro project, when uh, that was kicking off, we had a, a, a very important meeting with the head of their project safety, health and safety. They suggested they needed two people three days a week on the ground at the project, um, running them through the Mates Construction Training. We, we, didn't, we just didn't have the resources. We didn't have the people uh, to do it because they were all busy doing other stuff. So um, we'd love to put on more people. We're a very small team. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I just wanted to make that point. But look, we, um, we think we're onto something uh, in mates in construction. Um, certainly uh, when we get it out there in the industry, um, we've got a lot of goodwill amongst our members. And we know that, that bravado, that, uh, you know, the men, uh, the men essentially uh, not being able to speak up and not communicate properly. We think we're making a difference. Um, that's coming out now where we have one in 20 uh, on our sites. We have a ratio of one in 20 connectors who are connecting, train connectors to connect people to help. We don't seek to be the mental health professionals. Um, we don't want to be. It is about those 93% of construction workers in the past that have suicided who never sought professional help. Um, so we, um, I think we are making a difference. We are getting out there. We are connecting with people like Roses in the Ocean. We do have um, uh, lived experience staff, all our staff, including myself, we all, we've all had the lived experience. Uh, we do connect construction workers with Roses in the Ocean. We do connect Great. construction Great. workers with a lot of areas. Great. Thanks, Thanks Brad. Thanks, Brad. Thanks for being here. Um, and yeah, Rose in the Ocean, I'm sorry, Mason Construction is, uh, is, a, is a great example of a, of a, of a service that uh, targets you know, men specifically. Whenever I go out talking about men's health, I'll often, of course, talk about the terrible state of men's health, but I also talk about what there is to celebrate. And from an Australian perspective, one thing to celebrate is we have a really vibrant and interesting men's health sector, something that we don't appreciate you get from my accent that I'm from Queensland, but before I was a Queenslander, I, um, I'm, I'm from England, obviously. And uh, when you come from outside of Australia, you realize that this isn't normal, having these great organizations focused at men. We are doing, we can do better, but we're doing extraordinarily well. And I often highlight to, to, as the example, a couple of things that Australia has given the world in terms of men's health. Um, Movember uh, came from Australia. The men's sheds movement, which has spread around the world, came from Australia. And because things need to come in threes, I will often then mention mates in construction, which isn't well, as well known, but really is a fine example of, of an of a, of a innovative program that targets men uh, where they are in the workplace on, on construction sites. Uh, and we've got Movember here, Zach Seidler, he's coming up soon, after Tim Hodgson and Professor Richard Fletcher. So I'm going to hand over to um, uh, 
from Gotcha for Life, an organization that was also involved in making this event happen, uh, the CEO, uh, Tim Hodgson. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you very much for having me here and organizing. And thank you, Minister, for your time. And, and great to see everyone. Um, my recent background, I guess, is, is been involved in bringing the Invictus Games to Australia. Uh, and that was an incredible experience, um, largely because it brought together 500 competitors from around the world who all had lived experience in mental health. And they were advocating for the positive impact of being active and connected. Uh, and having that support group around them to help them, <clears throat> excuse me, through um, their tough times and to help them to rehabilitate. And I guess, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what led me to uh, Gotcha for Life post the Invictus Games and their role in building the connective tissue of society in a time when we are obviously battling uh, and becoming potentially less connected as individuals uh, in a real way. Um, through all the challenges and, and uh, time pressures and screen time, et cetera, et cetera, that we're facing these days. So at Gotcha, we believe in prevention through connection, that is pre um, preventing instances of poor mental health through building the better uh, connective tissues as we kind of understand the issues uh, that isolation and internalizing challenges can have. And of course, you know, recognizing and acknowledging all the other uh, issues that we need to face that all the great speakers have spoken about before. So we talk about building mental fitness. Mental fitness for us is uh, building our emotional muscle. So that is understanding our emotions, but also having the capacity to talk about them. So whilst we may all want to connect and we, we may all want to talk, it's actually tough. It's really tough to open up about the challenges in your life. But as you do and when you do, you can also deepen your social connections uh, and you can create those bonds around you uh, that can give us both an individual resilience, but also a community resilience. So building that support network that can look after each other earlier, can recognize issues in each other earlier, talk about it earlier and support each other earlier before it becomes uh, a bigger issue. Uh, so we'll talk about building mental fitness. If there was one thing back to the question that you know, one change uh, or area of investment that I would like to see more of is, is building mental fitness in our young people. So in schools, secondary schools, perhaps in particular, uh, where these minds are so formative, uh, the emotions are being stressed and strained and uh, the connective tissues are being challenged through social and screen time. And if we are a lens on longer term, sustainable cultural change in our society, we need to build this mental fitness in our young people in Australia. Right. Thank, thanks, Tim. Um, there are so many different angles that we can address this complex issue from. Uh, and one that's really sort of, you know, taken, taken root in, in recent years in, in Australia is this desire amongst, amongst men to get involved um, with some kind of movement to address this, this issue. And you can see that in the way that people have embraced organisations like Gotcha for Life that's you know really gone from from zero to something in just a couple of years the way that people support um, November campaigns the way that people support social um, and men support social media campaigns and there's a lot of grassroots stuff happening uh, at that community level where men really want to get engaged which reminds me of the, the beginnings of the men's sheds movement uh, sort of 20 25 years ago uh, and I'm going to post a link in a moment to um, an event we're running in a couple of weeks called the, the, the Men's Mental Health Movement Meetup, where a number of those organizations are actually coming together to talk for the first time as part of a summit we're running in a couple of weeks. Um, but I'm gonna go back to our speakers. Uh, we've got uh, coming up, uh, uh, Professor Richard Fletcher, then I'll go to Zach Steidler and then Pete Schmeagle. So Professor Richard Fletcher, thank you for being here. Good day, and thanks for the opportunity. Thanks to the minister and all those people who organized it. And thanks to those other speakers. This is great information. Um, I'm Richard Fletcher. I'm an associate professor uh, in the Faculty of Health and Medicine at the University of Newcastle. For five years, we've been running SMS for Dads, which is a text-based program, sends messages to dads from 16 weeks into the pregnancy through till the baby's a year old, initially funded by Movember. Uh, but now, uh, we're just running it. And one of the features of it, let me say before I run on, is that every few weeks we ask dads 
how they're going. So we text them three times a week. And when we ask them how they're going, if they indicate that they're in distress and they haven't got anybody to talk to, then the software escalates them to Panda, who calls them. And Panda tell us that when they call those men, and not that many men escalate, when they call those men, yes, they were at the point of uh, doing something drastic to themselves or to their families. So this is an ongoing suicide prevention program. We're just about to launch a New South Wales health program targeting 30,000 fathers. And that will be a boost to that, pro to that approach. It will cover four local health districts, two of them rural. But the two things that are missing, I would say, even though I'm very appreciative of, of the opportunity to try it with such a large group of dads, two things are missing. One is that there's no extra funding to target Aboriginal families. And that's something that we know is a high risk group. Uh, we know from previous work that just using general approaches, even though you get support in principle uh, to invite Aboriginal dads, that less than 1% of your take up will be Aboriginal. So that would be a useful adjunct to this existing project. The second thing is that it's a terrific opportunity for staff development. Uh, we know that the staff will be happy to hand out leaflets and tell dads, hey, why don't you join up here, uh, SMS for dads. Uh, but that's only really a part of the picture that would, would help if we change the way health services notice fathers uh, across the board, not just um, to sign them up to something or when there's a catastrophe, but when they notice them, when they see couples uh, noticing whether they're talking to the father, whether they're asking him things. We have a national program already asking mums about their mental health. This will be an initiative which would be a template for a national program for asking men about their mental health. But having health workers who are tuned in to fathers as well as mothers, uh, that would be great. And this is an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, lovely to see you again. And thanks for your contribution. Great to hear that uh, SMS for Dads is still going strong. Um, so just glancing across the room, so many people here, people from primary health networks, from across the suicide prevention sector, uh, fathering, health systems, uh, different academics. Um, thanks all for being here. Do contribute in the chat box. And uh, thanks for our uh, top table for, um, for being so uh, on form with the, uh, the two minutes um, precise talks. And we'll be going to breakouts after this where you'll all get a contribution to, to speak. Um, we have two more speakers. Uh, and I'm going to go to Zach's, Dr. Zach Seidler. Uh, so, oh, November. Thank you for that, Glenn. I appreciate it. Um, Nice to see you all. My name is Dr. Zach Seidler. I've, I wear a couple of hats or moustaches, depending on the month. Um, I am the Director of Mental Health Training at Movember Foundation, the Global Men's Health Charity. I'm also a research fellow at University of Melbourne, and I'm a clinical psychologist um, who specialises in working with men. Um, I could very easily echo everything uh, that John and all the way up until, um, until myself have, have said, and I'm in agreement with all of you that I'm going to try and take a different approach. Um, I think that having seen between 10 and 15 men who have attempted suicide this year, um, and I do this in my off time, so it's, uh, it's, it's not really leisurely, I can tell you, but uh, there is no one problem. There is no one answer to this situation. It is extremely complex. Every man has a different story and every man... Uh, you know, gets to a point of distress and suicidality in a very different way. Um, so we need to come at it from a very multifaceted manner um, and, and with respect for each man's story. Um, taking that into account, my, my approach um, as a clinician, I'm going to talk about services, which is to say that uh, services are not made with men in mind. Um, when it comes to EDs all the way down to your general practitioner, your psychologist or psychiatrist, they are not understanding um, how men experience distress, how they respond um, to mental health treatment. Um, they don't take into account masculine socialization um, and all of the situational stresses that many men face, as we've discussed, um, social determinants of health from, you know, um, unemployment and financial distress to um, relationship breakdown, which are all serious risk factors um, 
for men when it comes to their suicidality. And my research um, has kind of shown that. I want to echo Glenn's point around the fact that there is no better place to be in the world when it comes to men's mental health. I'm very lucky that yesterday I'm, I'm part of a grant um, announced by Greg Hunt for $6 million in men's mental health um, and suicide prevention. This is unheard of um, anywhere in the world. So we are making moves and we are all in the right place at the right time, I think. Um, so what it comes down to, I think, and, and my approach is we need to stop putting the onus on men to change when it comes to their mental health treatment. You cannot fit a, a you know, square peg in a round hole. You need to adapt the services. You need to make them male focused and male friendly. You need to teach the clinicians what they need to know to be able to understand and respond to men from curricula all the way up into continuing education. You can't just expect that men are just going to be able to walk into an extremely foreign environment like therapy and just be able to, to adapt and, and go with it. So that is my uh, two cents for this morning. And thank you for having me. Thanks, Zach. Thanks for being here. Um, so we have one speaker left. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assert Chair's privilege here and just uh, check in my one thing, which is really simple. Um, male suicide policy or strategy or action plan. Um, I, I think if you really want to focus on an issue, you can't address it from a generic plan. You need to specifically target uh, men. That doesn't mean excluding women, but it means going through the process of putting in place a strategy, a policy, or an action plan that makes you think about what specifically you're going to do differently to, to reach men, which really builds on what Zach just said about not putting the onus on men. Let's not try and reorientate men to services. Let us try and reorientate services to men. And the starting point is with the policy and the strategy and the action plans. Um, I've saved uh, last but not least uh, is uh, our, our board member uh, and, and much more besides uh, and the man who uh, this event wouldn't have happened without actually um, the catalyst for this event, um, Pete Smeagle. I'm hoping Pete's, oh, sorry, Melia. Ah, oh, we need to unmute Pete. Ask to unmute Pete. I'm amazingly honored and excited to be part of this conversation and to, to listen to the very smart people who have uh, preceded me. It, is really encouraging. I'm a former uh, ministerial advisor, I'm former CEO of Lifeline. I run a industry association in the high vis space uh, nowadays. I do board work, I'm an advocate. I think I'm probably most proud of the fact that I'm a person of lived experience, uh, both through my family and directly uh, as a user of mental health services and suicide uh, intervention services here in New South Wales. Um, one of the things about lived experiences is you start to listen a lot um, because you're not that good at listening to yourself or you're not that good at figuring out what's going on in your own head. You listen to other people who are smarter than you. And in listening to this conversation, I've heard things like targeting by factors, localism, the importance of peer support, lived experience involvement, building on men's skills and strengths rather than perceived weaknesses, the importance of connection, combating isolation. All of those things are amazingly valid. Uh, you know, Zach's point about complexity, absolutely. All of those things are 100% are spot on. But let's put ourselves in the, in the shoes of the minister as she's listening to this, which I've had to do in former lives. How do you take all of these really good ideas these important pieces of intellectual capital and actually do something with them. And to that end, I think I might uh, amplify Glenn's point and, um, and put to the minister um, uh, two ideas. Um, I know I'm extending the rule by one. But the first idea is, you know, stuff happens in government according to legislation and to policy. And in terms of legislation, one opportunity in New South Wales is to include mental well-being and suicide resilience within the framework for workplace health and safety. The New South Wales Workplace Health and Safety Act, which puts duties on employers uh, and throughout various supply chains uh, for particular outcomes. Um, there's no reason that suicide prevention can't be part of that framework in order to drive particular decision making and choices, programs, funding, et cetera. So that's number one. Number two, Minister, I put to you is exactly what uh, Glenn is saying. It is fantastic that New South Wales is a genuine leader in suicide prevention. 
It is great that I can sit down with the Premier and talk to her about these issues, and she's conversant about this stuff, and she believes passionately in, in the male dimension and in peer support and all those things. And it's great that this, the overall strategic framework does acknowledge men, but as Glenn says, given the numbers, given the need, there's probably a strong argument that says there should probably be, let's say, a ministerial priority statement around uh, male suicide resilience. Um, Zach actually came up with a great name, Made with Men in Mind. So, Minister, I guess uh, that would be an ask for me as sort of the last speaker is, would you be willing to consider authorizing a process with the department, with stakeholders, uh, with this excellent group of people here to try to develop a ministerial priority statement around suicide results. Thanks, Pete. So I'm going to hand back to the minister to ask if uh, she wants to respond to uh, any, of the, any of the comments, including your, your question, Pete. Uh, but first, Thank you to all the speakers. You did an extraordinary job of packing so much information into your two to three minute slots. And thank you for your time and from what you've, uh, what you, what you've shared. I'll, I'll hand back to, to the minister. <laughs> oh, bless you. Yeah, look, thank <laughs> Hope you're gonna go for a swab. Um, I, um, look, thanks very much everyone again for your time. That was great to listen and to hear. I'm really interested in, um, I've always said this, I'm really interested in solutions and I'm really interested in hearing about what you think we can do. I was really interested, you know, in the thing, um, I forget who said it, I'm sorry, but you know, about young people and investing there. And um, I've um, been, well before I became a minister, I worked towards getting school nurses back in schools to look at mental health and mental wellbeing as another trajectory because we knew that young people weren't accessing counsellors because of the stigma associated with that. So. I'm really keen to hear about that. It was great to see the tier online as well. We've been doing quite a bit of work with them as well, um, looking at going into schools. Um, uh, Pete, your comments at the end, really happy to look at it. Obviously, you know, I'm, I'm, look, I'm, I very much wear my heart on my sleeve. I don't say what I can't do, but I, I can't commit to anything, obviously, until I have a look at it and see. I, I think you make a really valid point about wellbeing. And I think that um, particularly through the bushfire response, we've actually seen that when people often talk about mental health, it's actually mental wellbeing. And whoever else said as well in the beginning that, you know, we can tell people to put their hand up and we can tell them that they need to talk and we want them to, but if we don't, if we don't fix those social determinants, all the talking in the world isn't going to help some of those people in terms of, of wellbeing. And we've particularly seen that in the fires and I think it's allowed us a lot of insights. Um, my own family were burnt out on our property at Adelong. So it's been an, an interesting time for me to see it from both sides of the angle and to see those um, mental health, mental wellbeing responses. But look, I'm really happy to look at what you said. And um, I've had my team here as well. Um, I've had Lucinda Burke, my deputy chief of staff, and also Dan, my chief, just listening in as well. So I'm really happy to have a look at that. But I'm really focused on the doing um, in the next next little while, particularly while we've got this extra funding. I, th I think it's really important to get some things done and to try some try some things as well. And um, yes, and that's all. And look, the only other quick thing I'll say is I saw Tess online as well, and I'm a very big supporter of that of that program as well. I think one thing we've seen with the Rural Adversity Mental Health Program is we've seen the ability and it was talked about on this as well, about local services. I, I was a nurse for over 20 years, most of that time spent in Cooma, so doing rural and regional. And the best thing that we can do is we can bring up local people, we can provide that support so that they can provide the services because no one knows the community like those people themselves. And I think that's what the ramps coordinators are able to do. When I want to really know what's going on in a rural and regional community, I want to go to them and I want to find out because they can burrow into those services. So. Um, and look, I'm, I'm not, I don't mean to sort of say, oh, we're doing things, because I know we've got so much more to do, but I'm, I'm proud of where we're at, but really none of that would be possible without all of you. It's um, really impressive for me to hear you all and see you all in one place and realise the incredible work that you're doing in men's health. I'm even a bit blown away <laughs> as the Minister for Mental Health. So thanks very much for your time and, um, and let's keep working together. I'd, I'd be really keen for that. Great. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for, for giving your time today. Um, um, you've helped us bring together this uh, great array of people because 
there's something very magical and powerful when you say when you put the words minister on a, on, on an invite um so just by having your name you've brought us together but you've also been more than just a name you've contributed and we've learned a lot and uh, it's really great to make the connection um so thank you for giving your time and, and helping us make this very important um, conversation happen yeah look that's very kind of you i hope i hope you're not disappointed um but um i i think too it would be really great once we can all meet and get together and just to keep you all updated about where we're going with our framework and where we're up to and really keen for feedback and um, and really, really keen for solutions. So um, we're, we're, we're doing our best. I've got a really good, I've got a really good team on this and I'm, I'm really pleased with the work they've done. I'm not saying it's perfect and I'm not saying that you all agree with it, but really keen for that interaction and to keep you all updated as we progress forward with um, with this investment into suicide prevention. And, um, and I love the fact that you're all talking about wellbeing. I think it's somewhere we've got to push through to. Thanks. Right. And look, we'll be, thank you. Yeah. And we'll be gathering okay. together the rest of the information from the day, making sure that, uh, make sure it's all fed back to you, everything that we've uh, talked about today through your team. That'd be great. And well run. You run a very good Zoom with lots of people. Impressive. Thank you. Well, fingers <laughs> crossed. Okay. There's still another couple of hours. Um, I look like I froze on my screen there. Yeah. Think, think, fingers crossed. I always get nervous with this stuff. Thank you. So um, thanks to the team at the top table. Um, what's going to happen in a minute um, before you sort of like reach out to grab um, to grab a, a, a glass of water or, or, or something is we're going to sort of transition uh, across the break into the next next part. So let me tell you what's going to happen first. Let's see if I can share my screen so that um, you can uh, you can see the, um, the the breakout rooms that we've we've got. So look, most of you have been allocated breakout rooms. Um, you may find that you're in one that you didn't quite want to be, or you want to be in a different one. Um, just allow that to unfold, but send us a message um, if, you, uh, if you want us to move you around, because I think the producer can probably uh, move a couple of people around. But you'll probably find that um, the, um, the, um, you've been put in the right place, I hope. What will happen is we'll press a button, pretty much, and you'll arrive in a different room. And it'll be all of a sudden there'll be like eight or nine of you, not not eighty of us. Um, in that room, we want you to um, get to know each other, make sure everyone has the opportunity to contribute, and to 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 look at three key questions. Um, you'll be familiar with these types of questions from these sorts of exercises. But in your area, if that's fatherhood or whether that's men's services or lived experience, what's already working well that we should keep doing? What are we doing, but we actually could do better? And, and, and then that sort of magic, sort of like elusive question, what new and innovative thing um, could we do? Um, and uh, some rooms you might, we might have allocated a chair, but some we haven't. We think you're all probably very capable of um, organizing yourselves. This is the bit of the day where you go to the round table with your butcher's paper and your pens, and then you have the argument about who's gonna be the chair and who's gonna be the note taker, just, just in Zoom. Um, I, I would ask that, um, I mean, you can self-organize yourself, so you can nominate a chair just to, to, to timekeep. Um, and I would ask that you try and find someone within you who can take some notes. Um, we've got hosts in the room and we'll try and record each breakout, but it's not as easy as it seems. We've never tried it before. So, um, so I would uh, ask that you just take some key notes, maybe on a Word document, and uh, one of you email that to us. And we'll also give you a chance to share that back. Um, so, um, so a note taker would be great in each room. Otherwise, the key ideas will be lost, whether that's on, on, a, on a Word doc or just on some paper that you take a, a snapshot of on your phone. Um, if you can resolve that, that would be great. And I'm going to hand over to, um, to Ben, who's going to explain what's going to happen better than I can, just in case I've missed anything. Uh, ben, yeah. You? yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Glenn. And uh, I'm assuming I can come through. My audio is, is moving well. Uh, yes. Thank you, everybody. And to Glenn's point, just to build on that, you will be going to a breakout room. We're going to give you about 45 minutes or so. We'll get started in earnest in the next minute or so. So as you move in, obviously, there'll be a little preamble, but we would love you to contribute as quickly as possible to get into the discussion and really bring your best ideas and some of those impressions and answer specifically those three questions in a safe space connected to a theme, as you can see on the screen. We're gonna activate those rooms now. Now, myself and a colleague will stay in the main room. So if you do get stuck, don't worry, we're here to help. 
um, reach us through chat or private message me. You can see that my name here isn't my actual name, uh, but you can use the main room name and chat to us in chat. We're gonna share the rooms now, they're gonna open, and uh, we will see you in the breakout rooms in the next minute or two. Thank you so much. You. Welcome back. Transported back to another space. Quite a surreal experience, like an out-of-body experience. Faces suddenly appearing. Welcome back, Dr. Fitzpatrick, Sarian Adams, Tessa Caton. Hello, Tessa, nice to see you. Your colleague, Claire. Rob Sams, hi, Rob. Good to see you. Rebecca, Sue Murray, Pavitra. Two screens now, so flooding in. Yeah, hey, Justin, hey, Amanda. Three screens, all coming back. Pete, Chris, uh, it's very, um, I don't know what it's like from your side, but I must say from the sort of, the, from the facilitator perspective, when normally you have a room full of people uh, that you can see all of them and just kind of keep half an eye on, on, on what's going on, the Zoom experience is, you just, is, is, is darkness. You just disappear. No idea what you're doing. No idea who's gone where, no idea if you've left, and no idea if you're coming back. But I've still got four screens, which is amazing. So that means that uh, um, pretty much everyone has uh, stuck around. For that. It all went very smoothly. Uh, Glenn, Glenn where, we took some notes. What, what do you want us to do with the notes, or where can I email them? Yeah, I'll pop my email in the, uh, in the box. Just send them straight through to me. That would be fantastic. Um, we, will, um, we will do... Um, We'll do a bit of a catch up. We're not going to go around every single group and find out everything that was said. Um, um, I know it's a, it's a long time being on Zoom. So we said 12.30 and our aim is to, to get you done by 12. Um, and um, so really welcome. I really um, be great if you, if you would stick around and share back, um, both um, speaking, but also sharing in the chat box, but also then passing on any notes that you have to us and we'll do our best to compile them. I'm just going to pop my email in the box there. Uh, you can use that to send straight through to me or for, for uh, anything you think is of interest, especially in relation to male suicide and men's health. Please do reach out anytime. Very happy to hear from people, particularly around um, anything that's to do at all with work to improve the lives and health of men and boys. Always happy to hear from, from people. And if, if we can't help, um, we'll certainly try and point you in the direction of uh, others that we know of. Right, so um, what we're going to do, and I think it'd be really great um, in this part to hear from some of the people who weren't at the top table, because um, uh, there's other voices in the room we'd love to hear. And so you've just gone through these, um, these three questions, and I think we'll use those three questions just to get some, some feedback. Um, like I said, we're not going to do the thing of going to every table and hearing your, your five-minute description of everything that went on, um, but what we'll do is we'll take a couple of a couple of shares but i also at that point this is again where the chat box can come up come in really handy you can't put too much information in the chat box because we'll save it all we'll grab it all one thing that you say may be really useful to someone watching um sometimes i found on these on on, on these types of meetings that the, the more interesting conversation kicks off in the chat box and that's okay because that's what happens in an event when you're in a room it's not always the guy at the front of the room or the person with the microphone who's, uh, who's most interesting to you personally. It might be the side conversation or the conversation at the table at the back or at the coffee in the coffee queue. So I really encourage you in this last uh, 15 minutes to, to um, use the chat box and share, particularly around those three questions, because not everyone's going to get the chance to, um, to, share, to share back. Um, ben, what's the best way here? I'm going to say, wait, what, you know, actually wave your hand, literally, and I might go looking for a couple of people, but also um, there's a raise hand icon. If you, I think what you need to do is um, go to the, again, go to the, the bar at the bottom and click on participants and next to your name, um, you'll, you'll see there's a whole load of icons. Yeah, Neil Hall, I see Neil Hall is raising hand. Someone's clapping there. Um, so yeah, so, so you can use the raise hand feature um, there as a way of sort of um, indicating that you want to you want to share something, um, and I'll try as well to across the three questions to try and make sure we come to every group as well, so that we get a we get a an insight into um in, into every every group. So, so the Glenn, 
Sorry, just to just to add to that, maybe use chat as well, just so it's quicker because you're scrolling through so many names. In okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. So you can say, I, you know, I want to say something or say what it is you want to say, just the headline like that. Yeah. So, um, and, and, you know, Ben, by all means, if you're, you're, you're seeing stuff in the chat box that I'm missing, give, give me, give me a shout as well. Um, so the first question we said is, is, is what is it we're already doing um, re really well? So who wants to, who wants to raise a hand or has something to share from one of those and, and um, Greg Milan and Rob. So Greg and Milan, I think you were running, or, or did you just put your hand up because you were practicing, Greg? Oh, I need to unmute yourself, Greg. No, um, Great. look, it's just, it's just a one off thing. I'm um, sorry, it's Greg Milan. I'm the president of AMHF. In our group, what, what, one of the things we didn't talk about and one of the things I haven't heard this morning is people bring up training and, and, and like training's good and we need to change training. And that. What we're all doing is moving our training from sitting in a room with people to being online. And we're all going through that process. So w w most of us have to go through that process first. And we don't have any guarantees for a long while about when we're going to be able to sit down with 10 people in a room and train them around suicide sort of prevention stuff. So we didn't discuss this. There's two parts to it. The process we're actually living and going through now with, with learning that and what the outcomes will be. So I'm just flagging that. And I think one of the things that might help and it's a big plug for a thing called Men's Health Connected, which is happening through June, as you all know. Um, and a big part of that is all of us learning. I mean, we've got tra we've been trained. We're lucky, but we're offering some of that training to people. And I think it's a whole learning experience with Zoom that's about to happen. So I think June's timely and valuable. Um, and I'm, I'm just bringing up the fact that, you know, that we Thanks, haven't Greg. talked about that this morning. But that's all right. Thanks, Greg. Thanks. That's a wonderfully shameless plug and you've done it for me. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to ask someone. That's brilliant. And so the question then is, I think, Greg, you're in the suicide prevention um, sector um, group. Yeah. So um, Tessa Kate and I'm going to come, come to. So the question yeah. is, what's, work, what's working well? And Tessa, you were in the rural men. Um, something we spoke about was the fact that men, are, particularly rural men, are really open to sharing their story now. So we've found that um, over the years, that sort of stigma and um, shame is starting to, to reduce. And we've got, you know, quite a, fl a flood of people that want to be a part of our podcast series and our glove box guides to really get the word out there. Um, and I think having someone that, you know, each community relates to is, is really important. So I think that's something that we're doing well in terms of incorporating the rural men's lived experience into um, each of our resources and the work that we do. Um, one sort of thing that we mentioned just in relation to training that we could possibly do better um, is following up with training participants. Um, so there's a lot of delivery of various different types of gatekeeper training. But what actually happens after they've finished that? How do we keep those people supported and connected? Um, and that's particularly important in rural areas because often that social network is the only, you know, one of the major resources of support. Um, we don't have the plethora of services that um, people in metropolitan areas. So I think, um, yeah, really supporting those um, community leaders and gatekeepers that have given up their time um, to do the training, but then, yeah, what happens next? Right. Thanks, Tessa. And look, thanks for you and your, um, your colleagues for, for, for being here and uh, including Dr. Scott Fitzpatrick, whose name I will have right for the rest of my life. I promise you, Dr. Scott Fitzpatrick. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I wonder if someone from the um, from the lived experience um, group, I think I saw Rob Lux hand up. Rob? Yes. Do you want to introduce yourself and, and uh, you know, what's working or what could we be, be doing better? Yes, it's Rob Luck from the Jack Luck Foundation and, the, and I was in the lived experience group, which is quite a dynamic group uh, with a lot of activity um, and experience in a lot of uh, fields, particularly in education, uh, but also in community groups, um, uh, personal experience with per community groups and particular groups that are already operating out there um, that are helping to train people and guide them uh, going into and out of that um, uh, drastic experiences. Uh, 
very good summary uh, from this group, I think is a reflection of what Peter Schmigel uh, made a comment in relation to uh, government policy for uh, the um, business and work and, and construction industry and so on, that this should be part of an overall policy framework. And we think there should be some more, there's been very good work done with the education side of it, but we need a policy from kindergarten to secondary school that provides for uh, coordination of all the groups getting access to the schools, um, a coordinated year-long program, and, and especially um, a way to ensure that the lived experience um, groups and speakers can get educate can get access to those schools in the proper way with the proper skill set. Um, and the second thing that came out of the group discussion was that um, until we reform the way in which men in particular are viewed on social media, uh, we are really up against this problem in a big way. Right. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate um, you giving time. And uh, I, I really appreciate um, everyone in the lived experience group who's come and uh, you know shared. I know it's going to be a really tough conversation and you guys contribute so much and really valuable, really valuable, valuable having you here. Thank you. And good to see you again. It's been too long, as I said. Thank you for having us. Yeah, good to see you, Rob. Um, so I'm going to look for someone in the um, masculinity group and someone in the situational distress group. I'm going to ask if you, I mean, you'll say what you need to say, but I'm going to ask that we try and shift the conversation to more what we need to do, um, do better. Um, and I'm seeing loads of comments in the, in the chat box. I'm trying to keep up with them, but we will capture all of these. So one of my experiences when you go through something like this and like, you know, the nominated person gets to, gets to tell everyone else what you said. And I often sit, I don't know about you, but I'm, I often sit there going, I don't think that was the most important thing or he missed out because what I said was the most important thing. And that's not been, he's not, he's not saying that or she's not saying that. One of the great features of Zoom is you don't have to just think that you can actually make, you know, if someone's speaking and they're not reflecting what you said, which is really difficult to do, just make sure that what you had to say is reflected in the chat box. Get, make your voice heard. This is the time. Um, uh, just, you can't put too much information into that chat box. It will be captured. And it's your opportunity to say it in your words rather than have someone else summarize it. So just going to look for a hand from James. Were you, James, were you in the masculinity group? Yes, I was in the masculinity group and a group of, of very educational, educated men and women. Um, just a great group. And, and I think it was said during the, the meeting that it was probably the highlight of the week and it definitely was for me. Um, so some of the things that we believe can be done and be done better uh, we believe a clear pathway for referrals to the programs that exist. So if you're in a conversation with someone, they, they, they obviously need help. What that next step is, just something that's really grassroots for, for the whole general public. Um, another big thing is getting the message out there that you're more likely to go through a significant mental health event than not. Moving away from the one in five uh, people have a diagnosis and more into everybody is going to experience something that's negative in mental health. So how, how can we um, include everyone? It's a complete inclusive type of statement from potentially the government. Um, and I think the third major one that we talked about was the language around mental health and, and trying to, to meet people uh, away from the stigma around the term of mental health. So potentially terms like mental well-being and mental fitness. So they're probably the three big ones that we talked about. But I, ho I hope somebody else can jump in if, if they would like from the masculinity group. Um, I'm going to say jump in the chat box uh, because we've got some other groups to go to, but thanks. That's great. Um, I am going to come to policy, to the suicide prevention sector, to the health system, to new fathers, but I'm going to ask, is there someone from, show a hand for someone from the situational distress uh, group or in the chat box? Um, Kim? Or do you, Kim, do you want to take it or pass it on to someone in the group? No Shavan one. is taking notes for us. Shavan? Hi, Glenn. Hi, Shavan. Hi. I've just posted the uh, um, points that uh, our group had discussed, uh, but mainly if we look at the current approach, everybody kind of in our group agreed that most the, the problem is that the current approach is 
current suicide prevention approach is in the hands of mental health and the whole approach should be changed to the holistic way of looking at the situational approach because even in any like even in the diagnosis of mental health if, even if we take the cases of the people suicided with uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia they would have experienced the suicide at some point of a time and even if when we start the conversation at a suicide prevention starts with the situation um so that's exactly what our uh, group has discussed and we have also suggested a few things what this forum should be doing following up after the discussion so i put the points in the chat box for right. everybody thanks, to see. yeah um, thanks for being here thanks for everyone at the uh, the mental health information resource center for your your support for this event today uh, i yet got the notes now that's great thank you um so i think health system and suicide prevention sectors. Anyone who is in this sort of the, within the PHNs or the health system looking for a hand or for someone in the chat box to uh, uh, jump forward? Really like to hear from the PHNs. You do a lot of important work or the health system. I might, I'll come back and see if we can, see if we can find a hand. Um, suicide prevention sector. Maybe Sue Murray, I saw you commenting earlier. Do you want to, do you have something you want to share from your group? Sorry, <clears throat> I was just unmuting. Um, okay. So I think one of the things, and, and I stress this within the group, so um, apologies to those if, if, if it's not all in agreement, but, and I put it in the chats as well, is the need for evaluation that we really can't get good policy in place without having more effective evaluation. And that evaluation should be funded as part and parcel of any programs that um, are being supported. And um, until that happens and until we get a good um, understanding of what works for whom and why, um, you're really not going to be able to deliver effective programs and services um, to anyone who needs it, but certainly um, not to this particular target audience we're talking about today. Great, thank you, Sue, appreciate that. And anyone else from the suicide prevention um, group wants to jump in and, and share what, share some stuff in the chat box, please do. Um, haven't heard from fatherhood, and I, I think also, if possible, want to shift towards now thinking about, yes, what we could do better, but also um, maybe what we could do different. I wonder, is Tom Docking here from Dad's group? Could Tom, um, would you share something back from the father group if you're able to unmute yourself, Tom, and introduce Thanks, yourself and let us know who you are? Thanks, Glenn. Hello, everyone. Um, yep, I'm in the fatherhood group, so if my little baby starts crying, Jojo, in the meantime, I'll have to race off to that. So that's my excuse if that happens. I hope it doesn't. Um, but we did have some great discussion there uh, around a number of different things. And one of the interesting things that came up uh, for us and we were, was just a question around is there any research into what new fathers actually want and um, there actually hasn't been much research into what new fathers really want so we we kind of discussed this a little bit but there is um, an exciting amount of new programs and projects that are happening across the nation um, but there's still this sense from new dads uh, over the years and hundreds if not thousands of conversations that new dads are looking to that they don't know what's out there and they don't know where to get help and it's not from a lack of the organizations trying to promote what they're doing so there's still this disconnect between uh, fathers wanting information and, wa and wanting to know where to go so um, one thing that was suggested was that um, collaboration between parties um, increased collaboration so it would be something that may address this um, sharing each other's programs talking about each other's programs potentially even having a co-developed central point um, for new fathers may be ideal these are all idealistic challenging uh, you know nice concept conceptually but implementing could be challenging ways that we could uh, support new fathers there's other some other um, really interesting key points around uh, leveraging the existing programs but also taking that to the next step around you know medicare rebates and and looking at um 
understanding how we can build in education into the undergraduate curriculum um, and, and also address the midwifery space as well with that capacity building. So a lot of, of great stuff there. I think one thing we could definitely say that everyone in that space we're doing really well is, um, is the programs that they're working on. There's some fascinating, amazing, really high quality programs out there. Um, there is a lot of space uh, to get them to the people that actually want them. Uh, and I think everyone is always struggling with that and no matter what program that you're doing is getting the great program to the people who really need them and want them. So um, yeah, and I think collaboration, um, strategic collaboration uh, would be a good step towards addressing that. Right. Thanks, you know, Tom. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Thanks for everyone in the fatherhood group. That look like an amazing group. I'm still looking for a hand or someone in the chat box from, from, the, from the health system. I might start shouting out names in a second, but I'm going to go to um, men's services, maybe Ian Westmoreland. Um, I know Pete's been taking notes, but Pete, you've had a chance at the top table, so maybe Ian Westmoreland. I was hoping Peter would do it. <laughs> <laughs> you, and, and you can wrestle over that. Uh, Peter, you, you're there. And okay. I'm happy to give Pete a second go by the cherry if that's what you want. Go, Pete. Yeah. Okay, all right, just a quick one. Uh, what's working well that we should keep going? Services that uh, do not judge anyone, just provide very simple support. Uh, simplicity works, we discuss things like the tradie walks, we're just taking guys on walks where they talk to each other actually works quite well. Uh, male friendly environments do equal men actually talking. Uh, so when we look at what can we do better, we need to kind of get rid of this uh, myth around men don't, men don't talk, they actually do. Uh, and that was the common experience of all of us who work in the services. If you create a male friendly environment, they talk. Um, in terms of what we could do better, and I focus on that session now, um, prevention is better than cure, but it appears that general policy is, is kind of geared up towards the crisis cure end rather than the prevention end. That was a, an issue. We also discussed the fact that government policy tends to stream organizations, no matter how large, I mean, un unless you get very large, but tends to be that you are streamed down a specific ministry and that comes with certain conditions. So you're either DSS or your uh, Department of Health funded, generally, uh, mm -hmm. if you're in the suicide sector, and that comes with uh, rules and regulations which are not particularly helpful at uh, allowing you to actually deliver the outcomes that you're supposed to be delivering. So whether there's some recognition that, that needs to be taken on by government there. The last bit in there that we thought was really critical was having some kind of representative body that could collectively speak on behalf of all of these smaller, really wonderful organizations that exist, but that individually just cannot fight against the power of the, the enormous animals that stand out on the plane as the ones that suck up all the resources. And I don't know what the answer is there, but whether there's some way to do that, and we're all going to point at AMHF to do it. Yes, absolutely. Oh, well, Pete, you get free membership for a year for saying that. Fantastic. Um, but yeah, absolutely. The, um, <laughs> not to step over anything else you've just shared, the value, I, I, having been paid to run the peak body for three years after it was Australian and Men's Health Forum was a peak body for 20, 20 or so years in different guises entirely voluntarily. I've seen the distance that having a paid member of staff in different rooms makes and imagine what more we could achieve for the men's sector if we had a bit more resource. Yeah. So one way to do that is for people to sign up and join. I'll post the join link on the page. Shameless really? plugging. So um, health does anyone from health want to just share what went in your room or did it not happen? Is it, is it was a, 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 did I say an Amy or Serin or Craig is offering help? to Craig Parsons is offering to do it. Oh, Craig. Oh, thank you. Craig, go ahead. Hi there. Thank you, um, Craig. No worries. Uh, Danielle uh, led our discussion. So Danielle, if you've got anything to add in, uh, let me know. So uh, we spoke about some of the things that are working well in terms of uh, services that are locally designed, or co-design, so really being responsive um, to the local region as being a strength in the system at the moment. Um, those services that have a holistic approach uh, that go beyond um, a mental health focus. So uh, Justin spoke about indigenous uh, conceptualizations of uh, suicide prevention or mental health and social and emotional well-being, and how uh, 
that really has a positive impact for uh, Indigenous men. Um, that can be obviously uh, extrapolated to the rest of the community as well. Um, we spoke uh, about the data that uh, PHN Commission Services collect and the ability to really analyze that and cut it uh, to have a look at uh, services that are, are producing outcomes for men. So not only uh, services that are reaching men, but also looking at uh, outcomes by gender for the services that we commission. Uh, and we also spoke about uh, dynamic system modeling and opportunities to use data uh, more in a, in a more innovative fashion as well. Um, and there's some really good examples of uh, local collaboratives that um, have a really positive impact in terms of uh, coordinating responses um, and innovating at a, at a regional level. So um, the Illawarra Shoalhaven uh, Collaborative is a really, really good example of that. And there's others obviously around uh, New South Wales as well. Thanks for taking that on, Craig. Um, really great to see so many primary health networks here. Um, from the outside, primary health networks can seem like mysterious um, uh, bodies, but they do it. They've been doing an awful lot of work on um, commissioning programs and targeting stuff at men in the last couple of years. So really important um, uh, part of the suicide prevention sector. I'm glad to say we've got a whole day focused on what primary health networks are doing in terms of male suicide prevention, just um, in a couple of weeks, part of the Men's Health Connected. Um, do come along to that. We've got some really interesting speakers about from projects all over the country. I've gone over 12 noon, but we're way before 12.30. Final group. Um, Pete, can I come back to Pete Schmeagel? Can I come back to your group and ask you or someone from there to wrap us up? Sure. Um, so when it comes to uh, public policy and frameworks around uh, male suicide prevention resilience. Sorry. Yes, please. Keep going, Pete. Uh, glass half full, glass half empty. Glass half full, um, unprecedented recognition and awareness that men are uh, a particularly uh, high risk group. Um, uh, uh, unprecedented sort of policy development in kind of what you might call the non-gendered development of policy, be it the Premier's priority, uh, the, the state framework, the national policy initiative, um, and all the programs that, fall, uh, that flow from that, whether it's on the state basis or the PHN basis. And within that um, um, kind of growing consensus around situational factors, the importance of face-to-face, -face, the importance of peers, lived experience, uh, demedicalizing uh, this stuff, putting names to things. That was one of the things that came up in our group is, you know, we're, we're taking male suicide from being this kind of anonymous and abstract concept at the policy level to being what it actually is in our own lives. We know these people. We know their names, right? We get their phone calls. So how do you actually tailor policy that basically is more personable, if you will, <laughs> you know, that is more related to the actual men who are going through this. So that was glass half full on the, on the, the uh, and, and really good examples in there, for example, from police who, uh, who have this new initiative called PACER, uh, whereby clinicians go out with police officers to men who are in crisis and find alternative solutions for them, et cetera. So it's sort of a representation of that broader policy thing. Now, in terms of, of glass half empty or what could be done better, uh, we were terrific because we had Jay Lee Skeen on our group, who is the advisor to uh, Christine Morgan, who was advising the prime minister on, on, on these issues. And amongst the ideas that came up was this is very smart. You know, I know it sounds a little bit high minded, but it's important. What is the male suicide prevention system? What is it beginning? What is its middle? What is its end? What is its preventative aspects? What is its interventative aspects? What is its aftercare aspects? Its educational aspects? In fact, Jelly made a good point is we need to actually define the male suicide prevention system. And as part of that, that it would be wise to undertake an audit uh, where are the gaps in education? Where are the gaps in intervention? Where are the gaps in uh, program delivery, uh, both on a, on a public sector basis and on an NGO community basis? Uh, and figure out, obviously, how you, you plug those gaps. And that all of that work should take place within an ethic of connection. Um, that, uh, you know, there's, there's actually a lot of research out there that shows now that it kind of doesn't matter what program you're running if the overall ethic is right. And if the ethic is one of care, compassion, and connection, you're kind of going to get it right uh, thereafter. 
Uh, and finally, uh, interesting point made by, by predecessors about a focal point for all of this. You know, how do you actually bring it together? How do you create momentum? How do you actually create accountability? So I, I'm going to put one out there right now um, that didn't get discussed in the group, but it seems to me as, a, as, a, as a, an idea. Uh, and Dan uh, Newman, this is for your ears. Uh, the crea creation of a ministerial advisory group for, for male suicide prevention um, with some of the folks uh, from this call on it, from, uh, with lived experience people on it, suitably representative across indigenous and other high risk communities and the complexity and diversity of, of, of males, if you will. Uh, I think, Dan, it would be a good thing to have, you know, some regular table where people can come back to this conversation and say, you remember we talked about, or can we push this ahead, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, a ministerial advisory group for, for male, male well-being and suicide prevention. Thanks, Pete. So thanks, everyone. Um, Pete, particularly thank you for being the catalyst for making the event happen. But then the event is nothing without all these people who've contributed. Um, just some quick notes from, from me. We will do our absolute best to collate everything that's been shared today and put it into some kind of format which can be coherently presented to the minister and her team. Um, if you've got um, any notes you want to send individually or, or on behalf of your, your group, do send them through to my email, which I'll post one more time just in case you missed it. Um, we'll follow up and make sure you all get a copy of that. If you've seen people today, you didn't quite catch their name, you want to find out who they were, I'm not going to share everyone's email because I didn't get permission, but we'll probably put the list of names in the, in the, in the report of attendees, but reach out to us. We, we are a peak body across the men's health sector. We aim to connect people. So if you don't know who someone is and you want to connect, that's what we do. Reach out and we'll connect you. Um, and that's it. Unless there's any, um, just as I wrap up and say my thank yous, just drop any questions into the chat box. If you think chat box, if you think we haven't covered something, and I'll try and um, I'll try and answer it now. But we are rapidly coming to a close. So thank you, Glenn. Glenn, I do want to say something. It's about you and to you. And I think modesty is fine, and I'm glad you're a modest person. But today wouldn't have happened. I mean, you're sure. Surely you'll say other people are involved. But you drove this and you're driving it and all power to your elbow. Just don't give up. Well done. Yeah, I think yeah. You have become and you are making AMHF a real peak body. Go for it, man. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. Can I also <laughs> thank you? Don't you make me cry, John McDonald. <laughs> Damn you. It's okay thank for men you. to cry, you know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, Thank you, because we're building it on your shoulders, John. Yep. And, you know, I still refer back to the research, you, the Central Coast report you did in 2003. Mm. And, you know, there would have been no AMHF without you and the others, yep. including Anthony Brown and Greg Milan in this room. Uh, and, and we're reaching out to other sectors, with, like all the people who attended today. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you to, uh, thank you particularly to the sort of three or four key organizations that made it happen. Peach Meagle, Roses in the Ocean, and, and Gotcha for Life, uh, Gus Warland and Tim Hodgson. Um, and then of course the minister and the minister's team, particularly uh, Dan, Dan Newland, who's uh, been our key point of, of contact. Then to all our top table speakers, I won't name you all, because uh, I'll probably get some of your names wrong because there isn't time. For every single individual and organization who participated today, particularly to those who took on taking notes and facilitating, um, to those who've lived experience, who've been generous in sharing their experience with us, to our staff and to uh, some of our volunteers, some people here volunteering and our, our international students who are, are, have just jumped in and, and are finding out what, what suicide prevention in Australia is uh, all about, and to, to the board of the organisation represented here by, 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 by Greg. Um, we'll do our best to summarize what you've done. We'll reach out and offer more opportunities to connect and do this work. But um, that's all I have other than to say thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for everything you, you do. Um, we will fade away to an end as you start to leave and there may be some random chat as you do so. Just make, yes, a clap, clapping for everyone. However, we do that, no. we do that on Zoom. You can icon clap as well. <laughs> You can start leaving. I'm going to just start plugging. I'm going to say, look out. out for Men's Health Connected. Monday, 1st of June, we've got Peach Schmeagle, 
Zach Seidler, Chris Lockwood of Mates in Construction, and Tim Hodgson of Gotcha for Live, all debating Mel's suicide. On, on Wednesday, we've got representatives from Suicide Prevention Australia, from, from Christine Morgan's national team, and hopefully from Queensland Mental Health Commission discussing um, Mel's suicide policy. All of those things are on the Men's Health Connected website. We'll send that information later. Um, it's Men's Health Week, third week of June. <laughs> Make sure you celebrate and mark that in some way, please. Yep. Um, and um, and if you've got any uh, end of year money slopping around uh, as we come up to June thirtieth, send it our way. We'll have some. We're we're not. <laughs> we'll, we'll take your money. <laughs> is that is that the last thing I'm going to say? I also want to acknowledge all the communities and the organisations we did manage to connect to and reach out to. Um, if you think we've missed people, I know we have. But if you think there's people we can connect to this conversation, let us know. I'll I'll shut up, John McDonald. <laughs> Thank you. John, do you want to say something? No, I'm saying goodbye. Goodbye, no. thank oh, you. I'll oh, 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 just do a quick plug, Glenn. Yeah. I'll just do a quick plug. If you are yeah. planning uh, any virtual events for Men's Health Week, please make sure that you register them on Men's Health Week website. Shravan has um, posted the, the site into the chat. That's Dr. Neil Hall uh, and the Men's Health Information Resource Centre who auspice and make sure that Men's Health Week happens every year. Thanks, uh, thanks them for being here. This is now the kind of informal chit chat at the end of the day. If you want to say something, jump in or you can, you, you're free to go. Thanks Glenn for everything. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Glenn. It, it, it's, Thank you, been, it's been great and so well chaired. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Anthony. Really appreciate you finding time to be here. It was fantastic. Cool.